In Long Skirts, a short story that became part of Rose Wilder Lane's novel, Old Hometown. Lane's main character, Ernestine, observes, I was too restless to listen to her. Under that midnight moon, I wildly wanted something I'd never known. And looking down the white road that went past the cemetery and on to far away and unimagined places, I said, Elsie, let's start down that road and walk and walk and keep on walking and never come back. While it's always dangerous to read autobiographical references into a writer's work, with Rose Wilder Lane and Wilder herself, it's almost irresistible. Both writers freely drew on the past and details from their own life. Both wrote autobiographical fiction. Lane drew heavily on her memories of her childhood in Mansfield, Missouri for her book, Old Hometown. And just as Laura in the Little House books is Wilder's alter ego, Ernestine's is Lane's in Old Hometown. And this passage from Long Skirts seems to encapsulate the essence of Lane's childhood, a longing for far away and unimagined places, and a life that would take Lane far beyond her old hometown. And another story from Old Hometown a mature and sophisticated Ernestine has left her childhood home behind and now moves on the world stage, New York, Bermuda, and the Balkans. In Paris, she meets an old friend who has shaken off the shackles of small town life, and Ernestine describes her friend like this. She is the type of American woman who is at home everywhere and nowhere. This could describe Rose Wilder Lane herself, a restless spirit who seemed at home everywhere and nowhere. In an article written for the Saturday Evening Post in 1935, Lane wrote, I have seen all the United States and something of Canada and the Caribbean, all of Europe except Spain, Turkey, Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, as far east as Baghdad, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, California, the Ozarks, and the Balkans are my hometowns. And yet, Rose Wilder Lane had a love-hate relationship with the Missouri Ozarks. After an extended stay at Rocky Ridge Farm with her parents in 1929, Lane wrote in her diary, I want to get away from here. And 10 years earlier, in 1919, she wrote this sketch of a scene she had observed in a Springfield train station. Men in overalls or $10 Sears and Roebuck Sunday suits that are as uncomfortable on the wearers as the wearers are in them. Thin-faced, straggled-haired women with babies in their arms and assorted children hanging to their drag skirts. Young girls in bright pink lawn waists and green brown plaid skirts not an especially flattering portrait of Ozark life. But Lane herself was born and raised in small towns. Her life began on December 5, 1886, in Dakota Territory. A doctor named Ruggles A. Cushman delivered her, Lane's grandmother, Caroline Ingalls, and Elizabeth Power, mother of her mother's friend, Mary Power, assisted with the birth. Wilder herself was just 19 when her daughter was born. In Pioneer Girl, Wilder explained how she and Almanzo had come to name their daughter, with a personal note to Rose written in the margin. In June, the wild roses bloomed. They were a low-growing bush, and when in bloom, the blossom made masses of wonderful color, all shades of pink, all over the prairie and the sweetest roses that ever bloomed. You are their namesake, my dear. From the beginning, Lane was strong-willed and determined. In an opening essay for On the Way Home, Lane wrote this caption to accompany this photograph. I was two years, four months old when this picture was taken in April, 1889. 
I remember the picture taking well, was impressed by the photographer's stupid pretense that there was a bird in the camera. The photographer also kept putting my right hand on top of my left, and I kept changing them back because I wanted my carnelian ring to show. And in the end, I won out. After years of relentless hardship, the young Wilder family left Dakota Territory and moved briefly to Minnesota, then south to Florida, motivated primarily by their need to find a milder climate. In 1888, at the age of 31, Almanzo Wilder suffered a debilitating stroke after a serious bout of diphtheria. Lane wrote that after her father recovered, he was walking slowly. He limped through the rest of his 90 years and was never as strong as he had been. Although Almanzo still wanted to farm, he couldn't tolerate the harsh winters of the upper Midwest. Florida seemed like a good solution, especially after Almanzo's brothers returned from there with glowing reports. The young family moved in 1891, but never truly felt at home there. By Wilder's account, we went to live in the piney woods of Florida, where the trees always murmur, where the butterflies are enormous, where plants that eat insects grow in moist places, and alligators inhabit the slowly moving waters of the rivers. But at that time, and in that place, a Yankee woman was more of a curiosity than any of these. They returned to South Dakota, which had become a state by then, in 1892, and then moved on to Missouri, as we've discussed, in 1894. Lane, unlike Wilder, left an extensive paper trail for biographers, critics, and scholars, diaries, letters, autobiographical essays and memoirs, as well as her autobiographical fiction. Most of her memories of the Ozarks weren't pleasant, here, for example, I lived through a childhood that was a nightmare. No sensitive child who has gone to school from a poverty-besieged home in patched clothes with secondhand books fails to learn that human beings are barbarous. In the same article, she added that in a few years, we were not so poor, but I was not invited to parties. I was left out. I was hurt and lonely.